Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the uh, plant breeding seminar. I'm Andrew Ward. I'm an arable farmer from just up the road in the bread basket of the world, which of course is Lincolnshire, farming 1,600 acres of all arable crops, wheat, spring barley, oilseed, rape, and sugar beet. Plant breeding, as you know, is a very complicated process and costs millions of pounds to bring a variety to the market. I get quite fed up hearing about the world population explosion that we hear about by 2050 and the number of mouths that we are going to have to feed. But it will happen and we're going to have to do this under huge constraints with our hands and ankles tied together. The EU are constantly putting obstacles in front of us. The new CAP regulations, three crop rule, EFAs, etc, etc. More land is being swallowed up by urbanisation and I think too much emphasis is put on the environment at the expense of good old-fashioned farming and food production. And you just have to look at the Somerset levels and the problems that we had there and the amount of wildlife destruction that was caused by the Environment Agency and Natural England trying to have their say. The plant breeders will play a big part in trying to achieve this increase in food production, but they must be allowed to operate without constraint. I think GM will play a big part in this food revolution, but if we are not careful, Europe will get left behind as third world countries adopt the technique and start to produce more food than we do, which if you think about that, it's an alarming situation. And the EU Commission are interfering continually with progression, and this must stop as well. And this is just another reason why I think we question whether we are a member or the UK is a member of the EU. Anyway, enough of me, and now for the speakers. First, we have Malcolm Hawksford from Rothamsted Research. He leads the Plant Nutrition Traits Group, which is the Rothamsted component of WISP, and he co-leads the 2020 Wheat Strategic Programme. Malcolm is also Deputy Head of the Plant Pathology and Crop Science Department and has overall responsibility for farm and trials operations at Rothenstead. Malcolm, over to you. The floor's yours. Thanks very much, Andrew, uh, for that very nice introduction. We should got my name right as well today. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, no. OK, so good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you for the organizers for giving me this opportunity to tell you about some of our work. So I'm from Rothamsted Research. Uh, Rothamsted is one of the, if not the oldest agricultural research institute in the world, 170 years old. And it's been working on wheat the, the whole time. Um, but what I'm going to talk about today is uh, a new program, which uh, started a couple of years ago, called the 2020 Wheat Program, which maybe some of you have heard about. Um, so. What I'm actually going to try and cover in my 10 or 15 minutes is um, a broad introduction to the 2020 Wheat Project, um, telling you about some of the components that we're focusing on. Okay, it's, it's not a, a comprehensive program. It can't focus on everything. But we've got some specific targets which we think can help contribute to our ultimate um, aim. And then in the second part of my talk, I just want to focus on a few of the technologies that we're using. Um, to help us achieve, achieve the goal. Uh, and these are technologies that we're using in a, in a research um, uh, environment, but actually which have all sorts of uh, potential spin-out applications too. Okay, so what exactly is 2020 week? Because there have been a few misconceptions um, around. <laughs> it's on, yeah, but what do you press? <laughs> Oh, yes, right, yeah. 2020 Wheat aims to provide the knowledge base and the tools to increase wheat yield potential in the UK to 20 tonnes per hectare in the next 20 years, OK? Not by 2020, that's the first misconception. And it's also about the knowledge and the tools. We're not plant breeders ourselves, at Rotham said. We work closely with plant breeding breeders, with the UK plant breeding community. And so what we are doing is looking at the underpinning traits, the underpinning characteristics, trying to identify where the limitations are, trying to make those improvements and then deliver the tools to, to the breeders. And it is about 
you know, trying to reach um, wheat yield potentials of 20 tons per hectare. And I'll say a little bit more about that in my next slide. But this is against the background. Actually, um, many people say that we have a plateauing of, 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 of wheat yields currently in, in, in the UK and Europe. That's not the case across the world, of course. Um, and indeed, there is an apparent plateauing. It's a little bit difficult to say to what extent, but the truth of the matter is, is that um, incremental rises are, are, are rather um, modest currently. Um, 50 years ago, we had the first green revolution, and we had massive increases in, in pro productivity. And, um, and that was particularly through the introduction of dwarf varieties, the ability to put more nitrogen on, um, but also the introductions of herbicides and pesticides, etc., all of which helped drive up productivity. So now, nowadays, farm, farm gate yields are, are actually um, uh, at, at, in this plateau stage. Okay. So um, the current situation, I mean, I hardly need to tell you all this. Currently, we're, we're, we're running around about eight tons per hectare farm gate in the UK. 20 years ago, we were about seven. So in the last 20 years, we've, we've only achieved a one ton per hectare overall improvement. So clearly, a 20 ton uh, yield um, is a big ask. We commonly um, achieve, in many of our yield trials, 13 or 14 tons per hectare. Uh, and I know many, many farmers also, in some of the best circumstances, also get um, yields in that region. Uh, the UK record, actually, I believe this year is, has gone up, is, is still held by Tim Lamb, remember, is, is, is slightly increased over that 14.3 tonnes per hectare. World record, about 15.6 tonnes per hectare. And yield mapping, as I indicate here, you can get regions of a field, we all know, which actually can yield really highly. So the yield potential is actually quite high already. It's not eight tons per hectare, it's actually more than 15 tons per hectare. So one key, um, one, one, one key aim is to try and reach that yield potential, as well as improving the yield potential or increasing the yield potential. Okay. So back to the 2020 challenges. We want to increase that yield potential. So we want to raise that 15 up to 20. We also need to take into account quality and quality issues. And so there are a whole bunch of considerations in, in, in relation to inputs, and particularly inputs uh, in relation to, to, say, nitrogen, for example. Um, I've already said that we need to, to minimize this gap between what's potentially um, uh, achievable and what is actually achieved. And this is a real big issue, and it's part of the program. Um, we do need to think about sustainable use of, of inputs and resources, and particularly fertilizers, and, and that's part of the program too. Um, one particular area of importance, and you'll see, see why in a couple of my later slides, is that we need to think about resilience and yield stability. You now, it's no good having really high um, potential produce, producing um, varieties, which actually um, can be very unstable from year to year. And part of that whole component is actually imagining what future climates will be. You know, what will the climate in 20 years uh, time be, or in 2050, you know, with increasing temperatures, increasing CO2, increasing uh, extreme weather events that we, we see already. So part of the program is actually about anticipating those changes as well. So very much taking a long-term view. OK, so there are four areas um, within the program. One is about this maximizing the yield potential. And that has both traditional approaches and it has um, some molecular uh, genetic modification approaches, which are really taking a long term and looking at some, some of the basic uh, limitations. Um, it also includes the, the efficient inputs, uh, particularly of nutrients. We have another pro part of the program which is specifically targeted at some pathogens, particularly at Septoria and Fusarium. Uh, another area that we're particularly strongly focusing is on, um, on the soil, soil root interactions, uh, an area that's been um, quite overlooked in the past. And then tying all that together, uh, and shown here in the middle, is, is a modeling component, which has really helped bringing all of the different facets together and also, as I said, um, uh, anticipating the future climates. This is an example of a more traditional approach and examining yield. And over a 10-year period, we've actually been collecting data, looking at different varieties and looking at their performance. Their performance at all sorts of different levels. Here I'm just showing grain yields, 
but also in terms of uh, nutrient use efficiency, for example. And you can see here they're order, ordered in terms of their average performance over the 10-year period. And um, what's, I mean, what's clear is that some varieties perform better than other varieties, okay? No big surprise there. And the other thing that's quite clear, the different symbols are actually different years, the trials in the different years. You can see the different years vary greatly, okay? Again, no surprise there, we all know that. But then when you start to mine in this, what you actually see are some varieties have a greater stability than others. And that's really what's, what's the importance of, of, of some of the data that's coming out of such a trial. So it's, it's about long-term studies, it's about comparing varieties, and it's about comparing the stability. And then breaking down the components of yield to see what's important. So that's one approach that we're taking. Another approach that we are taking, which is looking much more to the long term, is to look at some of the basic biochemistry that's going on inside uh, a wheat crop. Okay? And this is actually looking specifically at the processes involved in photosynthesis, the key process that generates yield. And when you start to look at the pathway, you realize that there are multiple steps which actually uh, are not as efficient as they could be. So we're targeting these individual steps through a whole series of different approaches. One might be just looking at natural variation amongst varieties, but another one is taking that GM approach to specifically target individual components of these pathways to improve the overall efficiency. And this could actually give real major step changes and improvements in yield. Okay. I've mentioned already, and I'm not going to go into any detail here, but we do work on Septorium Fusarium, and particularly the, the approach that we're taking is looking at these pathogens themselves and looking at the genetics of these pathogens to help us to target um, future ways of controlling um, their, uh, their, their resistance and, 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 um, and controlling their, their, their spread. Okay. I've said that we're looking at modeling and modeling future climates. This is one example of, of, of such a modeling uh, scenario. And this is comparing um, uh, the situation in the last century, 1960 to 1990, uh, and compared to 2050. And it's looking at the probability of certain weather uh, conditions affecting yield and how badly they, they, they will or are predicted to affect yield. And from this modeling, which is a combination of both climate modeling and crop performance modeling, um, we can see that actually in the 2050s, the prob problems relating to, to water stress, drought stress, are actually going to be much more decreased compared to problems associated with heat stress, and particularly heat stress at flowering. So this kind of modeling tells us that actually a target that we should be considering and looking at now is actually looking at varieties that will be resistant to heat stress at flowering. Okay, so the second part of my talk, last few minutes. My chairman hasn't told me five minutes yet. <laughs> um, is looking at some of the technologies that we're actually using. I mean, we do large-scale trials. I myself run trials of about 10,000 different plots. So that's combinations of different varieties and different uh, input treatments. And actually, this is an aerial view of, of, of such a trial. And working with these trials and these large trials requires us to have new ways of thinking about how, how we're actually going to evaluate them. Perfect. And the other thing that we're um, also focusing on, and I've already hinted a little bit, is, is actually what's going on under the ground. You know, what's going on with the roots? And there are lots of reasons for looking at that. So I'm going to show uh, a, a couple of slides on those too. I'm also going to talk a little bit about these UAVs, which of course are... Um, I think everybody's sort of thinking about and using, and the, the industry is just beginning to take on board some of that technology. We've actually been utilizing it in, in, in our trial evaluations. Uh, what I'm not going to talk about, but I will just mention a new development at Rothamsted, is a field-based robotic system for evaluation of crop performance and, and variety performance. And this will be completely automated and works 24-7, and we hope to have that in the ground next year. Um, and if you want to come along and see it, you're absolutely welcome to do so. Okay, so below the ground. First, a couple of little sl slides on, on what's going on below the ground. Reasons we're interested. We're interested in how roots, root structure and root performance affects uh, canopy performance and ultimately yield. We're also interested in, in uh, and have had a long-term program on take-all, take-all resistance and, uh, 
and uh, take or build up in the soil. Unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about that today. Okay, so methods for measuring what's going on with the roots. It's really difficult to dig up roots. You know, how do you look at roots? So we look for different proxy measurements. And one of the key proxy measurements that we're using at the moment is monitoring soil drying. So activity of the roots as they extract water from the soil. And there are different ways you can do this. You can measure soil strength by just pressing in a, a penetrometer, or there are various electromagnetic and electrical resistance methods that you can use for monitoring what's going on below ground in terms of the soil uh, drying out. And I've got a small example here, which um, is a cartoon. And what this shows in this field here, for example, as the crops grow, and you can see that beneath these plots, and these would be different genotypes, uh, different varieties, and you can see how the soil's drying out. Here, it doesn't dry out at all. This is a small fallow plot. And you can see also, comparing two different fields, there are quite different patterns. And actually what's going on here is that there's a hard soil layer here which actually prevents root penetration and hence uh, you don't get the drying out. So this is a method that we're using to, to look at the effectiveness of the roots. Okay, so finally what I want to talk about are some of the UAV uh, technologies. This is one experiment of mine, about 5,000 plots. And typically my students, uh, who are very hard working, um, they walk about 200 kilometers during a, a season, field walking, monitoring these plots, which is fine when the weather's fine, but when the weather isn't fine, it's not the students that complain, it's actually we can't use some of the instrumentation. So what we actually need are faster ways to, to evaluate these plots. And this is our UAV, which has got a number of different monitors mounted below it. It, it works through GPS, pre-programmed. And we can take pictures of our plots, and from the, the images, we can extract information in terms of crop health and crop growth. One thing we can extract, for example, is, is three-dimensional information. So we can measure how the crop height is varying between different treatments, for example. Okay. We can also use it for predicting yield. And there are three plots on this one figure here. And just to tell you that this is the best one, this is actually measuring um, canopy temperatures using a thermal camera. And this gives very good predictions of what yield will be. We can also look at crop greenness through uh, an indices known as uh, NDVI. And what actually these two plots here are doing are comparing ground-based and UAV-based uh, NDVI. And actually, the UAV-based measurements are better than walking around on the ground. So we, we think this is a, a great technology, useful in the research environment, but also with a lot of other applications. OK, I am actually finished. Um, so this is my team. I'd like to thank everybody uh, in the team, and particularly uh, my farm staff, who actually do all of the, all of the work. I thank uh, the BBSRC, who do a lot of the funding, and then, of course, also Syngenta, who, who's sponsoring this session, are also sponsoring some of the 2020 uh, wheat research program. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Malcolm. If you have any questions for Malcolm, please remember them, and we will have a 10-minute question and answer session at the end, if that's OK. Thank you, Malcolm. Very interesting. Next, next up is Dr. Christopher Wowie, and he is a wheat geneticist and project leader from the John Innes Centre. And if any of you have been around there or haven't been around there, it's well worth a visit. The work they do there is just fantastic. He studied agronomy in Chile and holds a PhD in genetics from the University of California. Cristobal was part of the team responsible for the identification of a gene conferring partial resistance to yellow rust, which is obviously a vital first step in developing long-term strategies for durable disease resistance. His team in the UK is focused on the identification of genes involved in wheat production traits, including pre-harvest sprouting, grain size, and the resistance to the wheat yellow rust pathogen. Christabel, over to you. Thanks, Andrew. If you, if you want that, it's that end one. Great, thanks. So thank you very much. Uh, I, I always start my, my talks with a slide of the field. Uh, I work in an institute that has lots of people with you know, PhDs and all that, and they just stay in the lab. They've never gone to the field. And one of the things I always try to stress to them is how important it is to actually understand how plants perform in the field. And I think it's really nice at the moment that with funding and through different uh, initiatives, there's a renewed interest 
in actually seeing how plants behave in the field. I think that's one of the big uh, challenges that we have at Rothamsted, at John Innes, and other institutes is to how do we take that science that we've learned in the lab and can we, are, are we actually smart enough to predict how those plants behave in the field? How do they behave under a real setting? So that's one of the big challenges we have and the field is where we need to test that. So as Andrew mentioned before, we, you know, we, we've all seen the food price index gone up, but I think the key thing is that we, we're at an end of cheap food. The era of cheap food is pretty much gone. And when we have these big spikes, it's usually linked to social unrest. So now it's not just about, okay, it's important to produce food, but actually for security, it's important to produce food at a, recent, at a decent cost. The message I want to give you today are, are four. The first thing is that we're in the middle of a DNA revolution, and I'll explain some more. The second question that we can discuss later, is it sustainable to actually continue to ignore transgenics? And I'll show you some examples of why I think it isn't sustainable. There's new plant breeding technologies as well that are not transgenic, but actually allow us to accelerate and enhance traditional breeding, and these are ongoing. And last but not least, something called synthetic biology, which is kind of uh, a mixture of different technologies, but it's actually going to really open up new possibilities that are probably beyond our imagination as we speak at the moment. And I'll show examples of those four things. <clears throat> Okay, so the first point I want to get across is that we're in the middle of this revolution. And one of the things that's most difficult to know is when you are in the middle of a revolution, to understand it. But be very clear about it. We are in the middle of this revolution. An example, very clearly, the cost of sequencing the human genome was done first in 2001. The cost of doing that was about $100 million, US dollars, to sequence one person. That price started to go down a little bit, but it was still $10 million just five or six years ago. And then through some very in interesting technologies that were developed in Cambridge and in the UK, sequencing costs suddenly went down. And basically, with the same place where we have Watson and Crick very close by, this new technology is now allowing us to sequence a human genome for about $10,000. So it's a complete change in the game of how we actually do our science. Before, imagine if I wanted to do a study and I wanted to understand something about you guys. I'd say, well, I need a really, 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 really big grant. But now I could sequence all of you for a normal grant, basically. It, it, it's cap we're capable of doing that. So if you think about the field now, for example, Malcolm talked about Septoria and Fusarium. We're doing the same thing with yellow rust. We didn't have the genome of these pathogens. We didn't know how they adapted. We didn't know which were the genes that were mutating to make them resistant to fungicides. Now we can sequence them. We can sequence a strain that's resistant versus a susceptible one. We can sequence the new warrior race of yellow rust and understand where it's coming from. It's coming from China. Do we need to look for resistances from China to bring here? So it really allows us to open up new questions, new hypotheses that we just couldn't do before. And that's the power of it. And we'll see more of this technology coming your way. So with this, I really want to flag up that I think it's really important that as farmers, you're aware that you're, we're in the middle of this revolution and that genetics and DNA is going to come your way. So we need to understand it because it is something that you're going to have to deal with in the, next, uh, in the next years. And we see it already in medicine. Now we're going into this 1,000 genome era. So this was earlier this year. Basically, now there's claims that you can sequence a whole human genome for $1,000 in 10 days. So you know, the barriers are gone. And of course, whatever happens in humans happens in plants and in animals just a few years later. And you can see that then with these technologies, we start doing this, gene therapy that could be used to treat certain diseases. One of the issues that we do have also that leads to the next subject will be, you know, if that actually said gene therapy could be used to make better plants, people say, oh, transgenics and this and that. So whenever it's in humans, we're happy. Whenever it's in plants, we're not. So I think that's a big challenge we have as, as a community to see how we break down those myths because this same technology that's being developed now in humans will be used for animals and in plants in the next five years. It's already happening and you need to be aware of that. So in the last five years, these are the genomes that have been sequenced, tomatoes, corn, uh, uh, grapes, strawberries, bananas, wheat, and barley. So all of this has been sequenced in the last five years. And the cool thing now is that we just don't sequence one, we sequence many. So instead of knowing, okay, we sequence one variety of wheat, the next challenge is to sequence a thousand varieties of wheat. How does KWS Santiago, how does uh, these different varieties, how do they behave? What are the genes that they have? What makes them special? What makes them adapted to the UK? And those are the kinds of questions that before we could just say, well, this one flowers earlier, this one I think has better roots. Now we can start asking those questions and answering them like we've never been able to do before. 
And in terms of just, just seeing how easy this is, there's a company called 23andMe. You have this little spit that you actually spit in there. You ship that to California. And for $1,000, you get your DNA sequence in a few weeks. All your DNA sequence. In plants, in animals, we do exactly the same thing. We don't spit, of course, but we cut a little leaf, we sequence it, and in about two weeks, we have the whole genome of wheat if we want to. So now the key thing is, what, how do we make sense of that data? And you're having the same problem. All these unmanned aerial vehicles, all the technology we have, lots of data, but how do we actually make sense of it? And that's one of the big challenges we have. But also, just to make the link between how this affects you, so actually MNS is already linking the genome of its consumers with the produce that they sell. So basically they say that some people who lack this gene, the GSTM1 gene, have problems in metabolizing a key vitamin. And they say actually there's broccoli called Benefort that they sell that has higher level of this vitamin that could actually help specifically that group of people. So actually the link is very, very close. And again, this is what happens in humans. So you can imagine that now we're gonna be seeing well, the animals that have this gene respond better to this sort of diet. The plants that have this or that gene will respond better to this fungicide treatments, will have less problems with drought under these conditions. So it's gonna get much more complex. So that's why I was saying, we really need to understand that DNA will come your way and you need to understand it because it's going to come your way and it's already coming. The second point was, is it sustainable to continue to ignore transgenics? So these are some transgenics, these are called purple tomatoes. And these were done by Kathy Martin at JI. And what she did, she took a gene from Snapdragon and she actually put it in tomato. And instead of just making lycopene, which we all know has good properties, it made other antioxidants. So I say, okay, that's interesting. But actually it gets more interesting when I tell you actually if you eat one tomato or if you eat tomato ketchup, that purple tomato ketchup, actually you're getting more anti uh, uh, antioxidants than if you eat a whole punnet of blueberries. So at this point you start arguing, well, you know, should we ignore transgenics if you're saying, well, we want more people to eat healthy? Well, yeah, go and buy your, your punnet of blueberries at Waitrose for two and a half pounds, or eat your tomato for 30p that everyone eats tomatoes. All the kids eat tomatoes, we all eat pizza, and you get all the same antioxidants. Is it fair that this technology that was paid by you and myself as well, we all pay taxes, is actually being deployed in the US and in Canada? So, just think about it, okay? And think about, you know, we're saying we need to eat more fruits and vegetables. This is a really good way, but we just can't access it. And of course you say, well, we can take pills, right? You can take these nice supplements. It doesn't work like that. We need to eat the vitamins in their, in their flesh, how they come in, in nature. And a nice study that was done by this group showed that when they fed mice that had, uh, were prone to cancer, basically when they had a normal diet and died with tomatoes, they basically started dying off at the same time and almost all the rats died when they were about 200 days old. When they gave them the purple tomatoes, you have rats that live 250 days. So now we start saying, well, I want some purple tomatoes, right? You know, I want to live a, few, a little bit longer, a little, little bit healthier. I don't want to get cancer. Well, actually, no, you can't because they're transgenics. Because someone says they're not safe when they're completely safe, right? So that, that's one of the issues. Another example is in terms of pesticides. So, this is Jonathan Jones from uh, Sainsbury Lab. And what he has here in his hand, that little thing there, is a potato from uh, the Andes. It's a very, very, very bad little crop, makes very small tubers, and you have a Desiree on his other hand. So he's trying to find what are the genes that make those Andean potatoes extremely resistant to late blight and move them into normal potatoes. So you say, great, we can do it with breeding. It would probably take about 50 years to do it by breeding because potato has the issue of being very heterozygous. It's very difficult to cross. It takes two years to flower and so on. So it makes it very difficult to move genes from wild into that. But he's able to find those genes. He's able to find those genes in those Andean crops and says, I have three or four different genes that give me resistance to late blight. And he's made desiree potatoes, normal potatoes, and the potatoes that have this combination of three genes stacked together. And the importance of having multiple genes means that if Phytophthora, if the pathogen of late blight is able to mutate and overcome a gene, we all see it with varieties of wheat that basically they, they become susceptible from one year to another. The same thing happens in potatoes. If you can put three genes, the pathogen can change for one, but not for the three at the same time. It will be very, very, very difficult. So it's a much more intelligent and long-term strategy. And when you see the field trials, you say, great, these are your normal desiree potatoes. These are the transgenics. 14 or 12 sprays a year versus no sprays. We all want to cut the, the use of fungicides and pesticides. Is it sustainable to continue to ignore transgenics? 
The last example is actually from, from Malcolm's uh, Institute from the Rothamsted by Jonathan Napier. Again, we've talked about, you know, we need to eat more fish, fish is good for uh, brain development and so on, but all of a sudden, well, we say, actually, but we can't overfish, we have issues. And how are we doing it today? We catch fish, we make it into a powder, and we give it to the fish again. Not very sustainable. So what uh, Jonathan has done through very basic research that took many years to develop, he's actually found genes in algae that are able to make omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids. These are the good fatty acids that we want. And he's been able to transform those genes and put them transgenically into oilseed rape. So now you can actually grow fields of oilseed rape that have enhanced omega-6, omega-3. Not for human consumption yet, but actually to feed the fish that then you can eat. So all of a sudden, you know, it, it's fantastic. This technology, thankfully now, after lots of years of funding from the more basic science uh, research institutes, has now been moved through TSB into more production areas. So now it's getting to market. Just to add the point, the potatoes are grown in Idaho, not in the UK. Those transgenic potatoes from Jonathan, they, they can't be grown here. But they're being licensed and grown in the, in, in, in the US. So is it sustainable to continue to ignore transgenics? We also talked about uh, these new technologies that we have now, new, new plant breeding techniques. And sometimes a lot of things that we want to do is actually take genes off or do things like that. Traditional transgenics include baggage. So when you put a gene in, you put lots of extra stuff. And that's been one of the key criticisms, that you're putting a lot of foreign DNA into a plant. With these, and, and they can insert anywhere. They're not very uh, reliable in that way, you would say. With these new technologies, basically, you can introduce foreign DNA, uh, or you can make new, new varieties, new crops, without introducing any foreign DNA. You basically, a lot of the things that we need is actually need to disrupt the gene. You can take a gene away, and the plant is basically identical, except that it has a few less genes, and that's all it does. And that plant will be more fit and so on. And these are new technologies. One of the big risks we have is that these new technologies are now being discussed in Brussels to know, are they transgenic or not? Well, yes, they involve a transgenic step, but then the transgene is not there. So you have no foreign DNA. You just take a little bit of DNA out. But these techniques are techniques that breeders now have in their in portfolio that hopefully they will be able to use for your benefit. And they'll have different names. So they have sink finger nucleases, tal effectors, and CRISPRs. So just to give you an idea, this is how they look when we try to publish stuff. We make them very complicated or like this. So we like to do like 3D models because that's pretty cool. But basically, the, the concept is that these new techniques are basically molecular scissors. With these scissors, we can go anywhere in the genome, cut specifically where we want, and then take the scissors out. So what you end up is with a plant that's identical, except that it has a few less genes or one few, uh, lesser gene. And that makes the plant more fit or more healthy for specific reasons. So very precise technology. But again, we're now discussing can we use it or not. The last point is, is just to give you the idea of, of what is coming up with synthetic biology. So <clears throat> if I put that phrase 40 years ago, you know, a college student writes new software, runs this on his mobile phone, creates a new app that everyone can download in the world and start using. You'd probably say, what's a mobile phone, right? I mean, it's like you know, science fiction. What is this? You know, that's what happens you know, everywhere in the world right now. Everyone's doing this. So synthetic biology is because we've gotten so good at sequencing DNA, we've also gotten very good at being able to generate DNA. So we can actually string together the different bases, the A, C, Ts, and Gs that make up DNA. We can string them together at a very low cost. So all of a sudden, before, we could actually string together about 20 bases, very, very little. It was very expensive. Now we can put several, several big chunks of DNA together. So now you can actually say, geneticist writes new chemical software, so I can actually make a gene, and I can run this on a living cell to produce new products and new enzymes. So synthetic biology gives us the opportunity to actually use DNA for our purpose, for, our, for whatever we want to use it for. It's now being used to generate uh, enzymes for metal industry, for mining, but very soon this will actually come to agriculture. And you need to be aware that will you accept it? Is it something you want or not? And just to give you an idea, because, they, because you can do this, they found a way to actually get, all the, get DNA and take the whole uh, works of, uh, of Shakespeare, encode it in DNA, they basically send it to the company, it got encoded in these letters, and they have a way to translate that. They sent it to a lab in Japan and say, can you please translate it back? And they basically made the whole works of Shakespeare without a problem. So we can actually store all the data that we want in a single test tube like this. All the data we know of in the world in a test tube like that. So imagine what we can now do in terms of creating new things. So it's a scary proposition, perhaps, but there's a lot of power in it, and we need to be aware of that as well. So just some final thoughts. 
We are all in the middle of a DNA revolution. It's going to impact you. So it's important that you become aware of genetics, of DNA, and how it can influence what you're doing. Again, we can discuss later, is it sustainable to continue to ignore transgenics? The new plant breeding techniques, which are non-transgenics per se, will really accelerate and redefine the way we're doing uh, traditional breeding. And the synthetic biology opens up new possibilities. And I'd just like to add that one of the key things is that as a, as a community, we need to be sure that we keep stressing to government and to funding agencies that this takes time. It doesn't, it, you know, it's not we make one initiative of TSB and that's going to solve everything. It takes time, at least 15 years in many cases from that initial studies to get it to the field are many times much, much more. And that's why it's so important that when we have these discussions, we really think about not saying we need more money for applied science. We should be saying we need more money for science and we need to be sure that that's split evenly between applied and basic. It doesn't make any sense to say, let's put more money into TSB and let's take away money from the basic science. All the ideas are in TSB right now is a basic science that is actually funneled into those ideas that can then be instrumental to be put into the field. But these are really one and the same. So we need to be sure that whenever the balance is swinging one way or another, we don't push it too far and that we are sure that these technologies and this basic science is still being done. The fish holes I showed you with Jonathan, probably 10 or 15 years of basic science research, and so on. And last but not least, it's not just about genetic diversity of plants, but it's also about human genetic diversity and getting the best people to do this work here in the UK. Thank you very much. Christabel, thank you very much for that. Very, very interesting. As, uh, as before with Malcolm, if you have any questions, please remember them, and we'll have a session uh, in a few minutes. Okay, last we have Sam Brook from Syngenta, who you'll notice when she comes up on stage here is a dab hand at breeding, and that is human breeding because she is eight months pregnant. So th well done, Sam, and congratulations for a month's time. Sam comes from a farming background, and she has been portfolio manager for genetics and plant growth regulators for Northern Europe since 2011 and developing new varieties and products for the UK, Ireland, Nordics and Benelux countries. Before 2011, Sam was the sales and marketing manager for UK cereal seed and since 2001 has held various roles within the cereal breeding industry. Ladies and gentlemen, Sam Brook. If you want that, Sam, it's that top one. Thanks, thanks, Andrew, for that, that lovely introduction. Uh, and as Andrew said, uh, my name's Sam Brook. I'm from Syngenta. Uh, and the most important part of my role um, is working with our breeding team at Syngenta uh, and with the industry using our varieties to ensure that there is the correct link between the varieties, the wheat and barley varieties, especially that we're bringing through in the UK, uh, and, and the, end, uh, the end use, the, the industry at the end of it. Um, I'd like to start my presentation with just a very short uh, but hopefully uh, thought-provoking uh, video. Millions of people have been saved from starvation by the food you have produced. Remember that children born today are exposed to these chemicals from birth. Now what is going to happen to them in adult life? If man were to faithfully follow the teachings of Miss Carson, we would return to the Dark Ages.
majority of farmers in Africa are smallholder farmers. If you can give them new types of input, seeds that will really help them in these drought times to get more yield on their farm, you'll transform their farm for them. provoking video and Andrew already mentioned at the beginning of this seminar with regards to world population boom um, and it is estimated uh, that the world population is increasing by two people per second so in the 20 minutes that I'm going to be speaking to you that's another 2,400 people obviously I'm hoping this one isn't going to be one of those if we look back 60 years we had to feed two people per hectare that is now double, and by 2050, it is expected to be up by six. The maths is simple, but I guess we can all agree the challenge is enormous. We need to produce more from our available resources, and we need to raise our productivity. And one of the most sustainable ways of doing this is by unlocking the potential um, of, of plants and of wheat and barley that we can grow in the UK. For example, wheat is grown more widely than any other crop in the world. As you can see, 220 million hectares, grown in 124 different countries, and producing over 800 million tonnes per year. It's the number two crop globally for feed. It's the number one crop in Europe for animal feed. And it's a multi-billion dollar business around the world. On top of that, the demand for wheat is set to double by 2050. And yet, wheat still remains in its technology infancy compared to other crops, where in vegetables, soybean, corn and rice, for example, hybridization and GM are becoming commonplace. Now, I think it's fair to say that neither Syngenta, nor indeed anyone else for that matter, has all the answers uh, to global food security challenges alone. But together, I think, and I believe, we, we can start to find some solutions. Advancements in breeding technification can be made. They can be made using partnerships, passionate people, and this is already happening. We have a global partnership with CIMIT, and, and our technology and advancements in breeding have already brought us from, from where we were with just using traditional breeding a decade ago, you know, a, a, a cycle taking 11 years to get a variety from original cross to market, to where we are now using applied technology, speeding up that time it takes to get a variety to market, and starting to put very interesting genes uh, into, into wheat, fusarium resistance, for, for example to where we need to be tomorrow, which is, uh, as already been mentioned by Christabel as well, really understanding that, taking it a step further, and making sure it's very relevant to the region, the area that we need to grow, need to grow those crops. We also have continuous engagement with stakeholders around the world. Now, those stakeholders can be governments, NGOs, policy makers, uh, food companies, and that's so important to ensure that when they're ready to go to the next step of technology, uh, that, that, we are, that we are as well. Now, now this is already happening. Um, for, for example, th these are all examples um, of, of current public and industry research into these different crops, looking at these different specific issues, problems, stress tolerance, uh, etc. Now, the, the challenge going forward is that we've leapt forward with gene sequencing so significantly in the, in the last decade, and we will do in the next decade. And, and, and the challenge is for breeders uh, to match those genes to relevant traits. And then again, to make them very relevant to what we need to grow uh, here in the UK or, or in Africa, wherever we might be targeting that variety. So, just to talk for a little bit about what we are already doing. So I talked, said we have made big steps forward in the last decade, uh, and, and we really have. Um, sorry, this slide is, it looks horribly complicated, but the important bit about this slide is that we still use traditional breeding. 
Christabel mentioned about the basic science and moving forward to applied science. Traditional breeding is the basic, the bricks of the, you know, the important part, the important part of breeding. Um, you know, it ensures we use interesting parents, it ensures we find contrasting traits, and that means we have the ultimate variability in varieties in order to select, uh, to select the best lines. We, we also use double haploid breeding. Now, I'm sure many of you will have heard of double haploid breeding. It has, has been around for a while now, but importantly, what it does is it ensures the very first cross between two different parent lines are completely stable. So that cross can then be used straight away. It doesn't have to be stabilized in the field like it used to be, uh, say, a, a decade ago, for example. And what that does is that speeds up our overall breeding progress by about three to four years. And that also enables us to be far more reactive to market demands. You can imagine when we were going back to an 11-year breeding cycle, predicting what the farmer might need in Africa, in the UK, in Russia, in 11 years was very tough. But it's significantly easier to do it in half, in half that time. We also use marker-assisted breeding, and um, we wouldn't be able to do that um, without the mapping uh, or the sequencing of the wheat and barley genome. Now, importantly for wheat and barley, this, this happened to start with, with rice. Um, and rice, as you can see, is a, is a more sim simplistic genome compared to wheat. Uh, and what it allowed us to do um, was find comparable traits uh, with the rice genome in order to speed up the mapping, the mapping of the wheat genome. Uh, an example of this would be, for example, the, uh, the restorer gene on hybrid barley. That was used, or that was discovered using these comparable traits from, from mapping the rice, uh, the rice genome. Now, we're, we're not there. We haven't mapped the wheat genome to 100%. I guess if you like doing a jigsaw puzzle on a Sunday afternoon, what it currently looks like is a jigsaw puzzle of a million pieces. Uh, and we're a certain way to putting it together but there is still a long way to go. You know, hence me talking about we've, we've leapt forward in the last decade and we will leap forward again in the next to having a complete understanding uh, of, that, of that wheat genome. However, there are a number of things we can, we can already do. Uh, and, and Christabel has, has, men has mentioned some of these with some great examples uh, already. And what are we doing specifically in cereals? Um, We've used marker-assisted uh, breeding to, to backcross, um, and to backcross a desired trait into uh, a variety that's suitable for growing. Uh, this, this example on, on the screen at the moment is in France. So this was targeting fusarium head blight resistance from a Chinese wheat, um, and then introgressing that into a bread wheat um, in France um, to enable quality bread wheat in France to, to have fusarium resistance. Within marker-assisted breeding, the tools we're using have moved on dramatically. Only four years ago, we were using markers called SSRs. Uh, these were quite approximate. They were good, and they gave us some of the answers, but they were certainly slower uh, and more expensive. We saw, that we saw the scissors in Christabel's presentation, and this is more what SMP markers give us. Um, they're far more approximate. Um, they map uh, within a gene um, and, and this really gives us uh, a clear black and white picture of what we're looking for, i.e. resistance or susceptibility. Uh, and, th and this is so important. Uh, it can be done very early stage, just a tiny snip of the leaf from these very young plants. We don't have to wait until the plant has grown and got infection in the field to find out whether it's going to be resistant or susceptible. So if we are looking, for example, for septoria triticae resistance, uh, plants in, in a mapping population within the breeding program, you know, we can discard plants very, very early on, uh, which is so important to the process. We, you know, septoria alone, it is a hot topic, estimated to cost the UK industry in some years 53 million pounds. Uh, interestingly, if we could improve septoria triticae resistance by one resistance point on varieties, we could potentially save the UK 10 million a year. And mapping will continue to increase dramatically. This is another example, um, and this is for specifically for barley. Um, we have many thousands of markers available um, for each barley chromosome. 
Uh, and these can be used to correlate very specific traits. And the one given here um, is molting quality. And even more in depth than just molting quality, it's hot water extract, it's enzyme activity. So we really are taking big steps forward in understanding these genomes. Also, importantly, the, the IT behind it has leapt forward at the same pace. So we can now process very, very big data sets. Uh, and that means that that gives breeders the ultimate tool uh, to support traditional breeding techniques uh, with this new applied, applied science. Now, I'd just quickly just like to use um, hybrid barley uh, as, a, as a case study. Now, hybrid barley, a relatively new breakthrough, breakthrough technology. Hyvedo is the, is the brand, the technology brand that we sell our hybrid barley varieties um, under, in the UK. And currently, hybrid barley is sold with a, a cashback yield guarantee supporting it, guaranteeing half a ton a hectare over a conventional variety. So, so what makes us so confident in hybrid barley uh, versus what a conventional barley can do? Tiny bit of science first. Um, what do we know? Well, a, a conventional variety um, will self-pollinate, so it pollinates before the anthers uh, come out, as it were. Um, so what you get with a conventional variety is what, what you had to start with. So it's exactly the same, exactly the same line. Um, a hybrid is the progeny of that very first cross of two selected parents, giving you the best of both of those parents. Um, and that is done um, by stopping the self-pollination of the female. And I'm afraid to all you guys in the room, the, the way that's done um, is, is actually by disrupting the male flowering parts uh, or the anthers. I'm told it's fairly painless. And in hybrid barley, uh, we do that using natural male sterility or naturally male sterile varieties. Now, these are harder to find, uh, but they are far more sustainable to produce uh, than trying the other techniques like chemical induced sterility, for example. So what does that mean? Well, that first cross every time uh, leads to heterosis. That's hybrid vigor. That's a bigger, stronger, healthier, better plant, uh, bigger rooting systems. You know, leading to better stress tolerance. We know hybrid barley yields higher. Um, we know that it has a bigger rooting structure. We know that it's uh, you know, better on poor, poorer soils, poorer land. Um, we also have the proof in the pudding of yield. Um, I talked a minute ago about the cashback yield guarantee confirming half a tonne a hectare over conventionals. Uh, this, is, this is a mere 500 trials across UK, France and Germany, uh, where in 60 uh, six percent of all cases the hybrid barley did yield that half a ton and that's over very variable seasons and very variable soil types but importantly over 92 percent of scenarios the yield was significantly higher than a, than a conventional. We also have the added benefit of these plants being very dominant in the field very healthy very big very, very vigorous uh, very vigorous plants and they do have an effect on suppressing grass weeds. Now, I guess a hot topic certainly for this region would be black grass. Uh, and this is a hybrid barley black grass trial we conducted this year. So not only did the, did the hybrid barley help reduce the overall black grass numbers within the hybrid barley plot versus a conventional, uh, sorry, versus a, a, a conventional winter wheat variety, uh, any plants that were left, you can see, were significantly poorer, smaller heads, smaller plants, uh, and lower vigor. So an, another interesting fact, a uh, topic that we're getting from, from understanding these, uh, these hybrid plants a lot more. Now, just, just to summarize, um, we do believe in Syngenta that plant breeding you know, does continue to have a critical part to play in, in raising our productivity and sustainability. And in the future and in the near future, there will be continued substantial genetic gains. These will increase rapidly. And also, we're likely to see, hopefully relatively quickly, hybridization in wheat. And this puts us in a great position to continue to drive forward um, hybrid, sorry, drive forward cereal breeding uh, and to hopefully really make a difference. Uh, thank you for your time. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sam. OK, just to sum up what we've heard, we first heard Malcolm Hawkshead talk about 20 years ago, the average UK wheat yield was 7 tonne a hectare. It's now 8.5. 
but in a lot of trials that they're doing at Rothamsted, they're regularly doing 14 tonnes a hectare. So we've got a long way to go to get up to that level and to get to 20 tonnes a hectare. We went through the challenges, which there are many, explaining about germplasm, nutrient availability, and of course that's vital to crops with, for photosynthesis, which in turn is so important to give us high yields. Also, Malcolm explained about yield loss due to drought. We then heard Christabel talk about why uh, we're in the middle of a DNA revolution and how costs have plummeted, which I didn't realise that, fascinating. Also about genomes, transgenics. Also mentioned GM, which is another interesting, interesting one. And of course, also we heard about how synthet synthetic biology opens up new possibilities in plant breeding and how long it takes to get a plant from the lab to the field, which we know is a long while. And lastly, we heard from Sam Brook, who gave us Syngenta's view on global food security. And we were feeding two people a hectare, and now it's four. And 22 million hectares of wheat worldwide is grown in 124 countries. Staggering information. And the demand for that will double by 2050. Hybrid barley vigour as well, very important. And also, Sam said about financial losses and showed us what they were without fungicides. Finally, to sum up, we have many challenges facing us, which we know. And pesticide resistance, obviously, is one. Black grass, another huge topic in this area. We have environmental regulations constantly placed on us by our own government and the EU. But without the fantastic varieties at our disposal, we would have many more problems. We are all in this together, every one of us in this building. And if there's one thing you go home with that I have said today, it's this. Please don't sit back and let legislation hinder or halt progressive farming, because that is what is happening. Be vocal, locally and nationally, and communicate with the public and tell them how safe the food is that we all produce. Sam, Malcolm and Christabel, thank you very much for your contribution to this seminar. And they will be available after if anybody would like a one-to-one -one discussion or question with them. Please make use of their expertise, it's fantastic. And also, outside here this seminar, please make use of visiting the seed companies and also the breeders out there today who are exhibiting. It's free, so please make use of that. And lastly, the seminar after this that was due to start at four o'clock is now, which is Managing Precision, is now going to start at 3.30. So if you'd like to come and listen to that, that will be starting shortly. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending this seminar, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the day.